Welcome to Inspiration and Transformation from the Banks of the Ganga with Sadvi Bhagwati Saraswati, an American sannyasi living at the Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, India. Sadvi is president of the Divine Shakti Foundation, a charitable organization bringing education, vocational training, upliftment, and empowerment programs to women and children. Sadvi is also Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and Director of the world famous International Yoga Festival. Join the musings of an American sannyasi as Sadvi shares the wisdom and teachings of her guru, His Holiness Pujya Swami Chidanand Saraswatiji. Welcome, everyone, to Inspiration and Transformation from the Holy Banks of the sacred Ganga River in the land of Rishikesh, India. What would you say about justice to someone who has proven to be wrongly accused and has spent time in prison as a result? All of that which we create is fallible. From our human bodies to all of the systems that we erect, whether it's our educational system, whether it's our healthcare system, whether it's our political system, whether it's our judicial system, they're fallible. They make mistakes. We could point at issues in educational systems, issues in healthcare systems. I mean, we could, we could choose any system. We could choose our human body and discuss the mistakes that it makes. So the justice system, being a system that was erected and is run by humans who are fallible, is therefore going to be fallible. It's going to make mistakes. There will be people who should have been imprisoned, who got let off, people who were innocent but ended up getting imprisoned. Fortunately, I believe that's a smaller number than those who actually should be in prison but are on the streets. In terms of what to say to someone who has been wrongly accused and convicted and therefore spent time in prison is to help them understand that being in prison was an incredible learning experience. Doesn't mean it was good. One of the things we speak about here in satsang all the time is that the purpose of life The aim of life is not about how many good feelings can I accumulate. It's about how much can I awaken. None of us has ever been promised, oh, your life is going to feel great every minute, every moment. Everything you eat is going to taste great. Every relationship you're in is going to feel great. Your life is, you're never going to feel anything other than greatness. Well, the minute that, you know, we scream and our mom doesn't come is the first minute that we realize, oh, wait, this doesn't feel so great. Then we get our first cold or flu or fever. We realize, oh, that doesn't feel so great. A few years later, we get chicken pox. A few years later, we show up at school and our best friend announces that she's no longer our best friend. And we move through the world realizing, oh, wait, The promise is not, it's all going to feel good. The promise is, if you make awakening your goal, it will happen. And the promise is, who you are is divine. There are no mistakes in the universe. You haven't been made as part of a bad batch. Who you are is perfect at the core, at the soul. 
doesn't mean that we don't all have our junk that we've put on top of it. Our egos, our emotions, our desires, our fears that make us act in certain ways. We then get the karmic repercussion of the ways we act. So that all happens. But who you are at the core is pure and perfect and divine. That's the promise. Not it's always going to feel good. And if you look at the scriptures, you look at the stories, whether it's Lord Krishna's life, whether it's Lord Ram's life. Lord Krishna was born in jail. And he's God. So his, his mother and father were imprisoned not even with an accusation of something they had done, but with a fear that their child was going to conquer, vanquish, remove, kill the evil king. Well, what's the solution to preventing someone's child from unseating me, well, I'll just imprison them and kill every child they have. And this is, this is what was done. So, so Krishna was, was born in jail. And he spent the first many years of life with this king through so many different ways trying to kill him. We feel bad when someone just doesn't help us with the dishes or is in kind of a bad mood or, you know, claims that what we did, they did, so they get credit for it or they take a bigger piece of cookie, literal or metaphoric. He actually spent his youth trying to be killed. And the reason I share this is when you recognize that these the stories, the epics that are given to us, they're given to us for a reason. I mean, if you're God and you're going to come on earth, well, obviously you've got the power to come on earth in any form, in any way, with any story that you want. He came with that story to give us a message. that it doesn't always feel good. But that when it doesn't always feel good, every picture you ever see of Krishna, he's playing his flute, he's singing. The message is, despite all of this, the song is on. The song never is off. There's nothing that happens in his life that makes him say, forget it, I'm not going to sing today. Forget it, I'm too miserable. We look at Lord Ram, another story of God coming on earth, the Ramayan. Well, he spends his youth, his early adulthood, as the epitome, the absolute epitome of the perfect son, the perfect brother, then the perfect husband. He's about to be coronated as king. And what happens? His stepmother tells his father, the king, no, do not coronate Ram. Coronate my son instead. I'm not going to go into the whole story of the Ramayan, but we know that what happens from that is that Ram ends up being banished to the forest. Fourteen years. Banished to the forest for nothing he did, for nothing he was even accused of doing, rightly or wrongly. Simply due to a a drama in the household. We'll call it and leave it at that. Yeah, otherwise you go all night into that story. 
but we'll call it a drama in the household. He was out. And again, you're God coming on earth. You've got the choice. Where do you want to take birth? In what form? In what city? In what story? This is how he came. So when we have examples of God's life on earth, and they are full of nothing but tribulations, much worse than what most of us have had to go through. Most of us have not spent years with someone trying to literally kill us at every turn. Most of us have not had to spend almost a decade and a half in the forest and then have our wives kidnapped, have to go off, find her, have a war. Both of the stories have wars. So the meaning of this is, yeah, stuff happens. This is part of the human existence. And even when you are God coming in a human form, the stuff still happens. But what's the message for us? The message for us is, how can we keep the song of who we are on? That's the message of Krishna's life. And when Ram came back to Ayodhya, after the 14 years, they lit the whole city with lights. That's what, that's what Diwali is. That's the celebration of Diwali is the time, the commemoration of the time that Ram came back to Ayodhya. And he then ruled in what's called Ram Raja, the great rule, the rule of perfection, the time when justice was perfect, the time when everyone had food to eat, everyone had water to drink, everyone had health care, whatever you could imagine as the most perfect rule. That was Ram Raja. And that came out of him being really unfairly treated. I mean, think about it in your life. If you were just about to get, okay, maybe most of us can't necessarily envision being about to be coronated king or queen, but you're just about to have something wonderful happen to you. You're about to get a great job. You're about to get a great house. You're about to get married. You're about to have a child. You're about to have, have one of these, these moments in life where it's just, yes, everything that I've, that I've worked for, who I am, is now culminating in this moment. And then at that moment, through no fault of your own at all, through nothing that you had anything to do with except the womb from which you came, it's all pulled out from beneath you. Most of us haven't, haven't had to deal with that. But after that, after that, and then after the 14 years in exile and the war, he comes back and creates perfection. So whether we've actually been wrongly accused, as in the question, and have spent time in an actual jail, an actual prison, or whether we've just spent years of our life in the prisons of our own minds, years of our lives in the jails of our own egos, our own desires, our own fears. Whether we've been locked up by another physical person holding the key or we've been locked up because we don't realize that we're free. What we really can do so many of us cut ourselves so short. Yeah, this is what I can do. This is what I'm capable of. This is how much time I have in a day. This is what my skills are. This is what my abilities are. We cut ourselves short. That's 
keeping yourselves locked up. And so the message for us is to be free. Whether it's now that I've gotten out of jail because somebody else locked me up in there, or I'm out of the jail of my own mind, or I'm trying to break free from the jail of my misconceptions. I've kept myself in jail. This is all I can do. I'm not that capable. I'm not that smart. I'm not that skilled. Don't have that much energy. Can't accomplish that much. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy with 10%. Well, it's, it's a jail in a way. Because we don't realize the fullness of really what we can do. And I don't necessarily mean career-wise. I mean in every minute and every moment of our lives. There's a beautiful beautiful saint who comes to our yoga festival frequently, Shankaracharya, who's one of the highest posts in the Hindu tradition. And he speaks so frequently about the importance of sincerity and the freedom to be sincere. We may not necessarily have the freedom to do whatever we want. Cities, countries have laws. People around us like certain things, don't like certain things. It's not a license to decadence or hedonism or recklessness. But what we have is a freedom to be sincere. In every minute and every moment. To who we are. As that fullness. And that freedom is the greatest freedom in the world. So that every minute of my life, whether I'm sitting physically in a jail cell or I'm sitting outside the jail cell. There's a lot of people outside the jail cell who are more stuck than people inside jail cells. So a lot of people who have actually had beautiful spiritual awakenings and openings in jail. So many stories of that. And so many people who are theoretically free but are not. So to this person and to all of us, we realize the importance of freedom, but it's not something someone else gives us. It's something we give ourselves. And we recognize that stuff happens in life, whether it's sitting in a prison, whether it's being banished to the forest, whether it's people trying to poison you, whether it's just the regular stuff of daily life. But we take that message of Krishna to have the song always on. We take the message of Lord Ram that the minute, the minute we have our freedom. You're listening to OTRFM, part of the IOM radio network. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single... Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Alaya, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Hi, this is Christina Ricci with Rain. Every two minutes, another American is sexually assaulted. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you are not alone. Help is just a call or click away through the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Please call 1-800-656-HOPE, that's H-O-P-E, or visit RAIN.org, that's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. Welcome back to Inspiration and Transformation. I'm so glad to have you all back here with me. What is the difference between looking for something 
and running away from something. When you come onto a spiritual path, or when you go anywhere for that matter, there's two ways of getting there. One way is actually moving toward where you want to go. The other is getting there because you are moving away from something that's in the other direction. So for example, in order to get to Rishikesh from Delhi, there's two ways you can do it. One way is you head off to Rishikesh and you figure out, I've got to find some way to get to Rishikesh, whether it's an airplane, whether it's a train, whether it's a car, whether it's a bus. Not many people are walking it anymore. But some vehicle I've got to find to get me there. My vision is on Rishikesh. But another way to do it is, I hate Delhi, I hate Delhi, I've got to get away from Delhi. And we push against Delhi, move away from Delhi, and if we happen to be pushing against Delhi in the northern direction, and we do it enough, you'll end up in Rishikesh. So the end result is the same, but there are two very, very distinct paths. And when we talk about, as the question asked, the difference between searching for something versus running from something else, this is what we're, we're looking at. On a spiritual path, it's very similar. Some people come onto a path because it's, I'm just, I'm dying to see, to see the divine, to experience the divine. Life is great as far as the things of life go, but I want something more. I want to experience the divine by whatever name, whatever form, but I, I want that experience. I want to expand my consciousness, connect with who I really am. Another way is, I'm really hurt. Life hurts. I am therefore going to move to an ashram, start meditating, take up yoga, do all of the things on a spiritual path. Now, there's n it's not that one is right and one is wrong, but I like the question because it, it implies a level of self-awareness. Very few of us are aware of how we ended up where we got. And the difference between moving toward versus moving away. What's important about it is if I come onto a spiritual path only because I've been running away from something, first of all, it's not going to go very deep. It'll last only as long as the pain that we're pushing against is. So someone broke my heart. I lost a loved one. I was fired from my job. Whatever it is, it stings. To get away from that sting, I start meditating. I move to an ashram. I join a spiritual community. Now, if I keep my agenda, my inner agenda, being only to be free of the pain of the person who broke my heart, the pain of losing my job, the pain of losing my loved one, then the minute that time heals that, which inevitably it will, I discover, oh, I don't actually really like living in an ashram. Or, oh, you know, I'm actually way too busy to keep up my meditation practice. Or, you know, I don't really like these people of my sangha much anyway. It was just, they were there when I had no one else. 
And so what you find is that the spiritual life becomes simply an escape. Better than alcohol, better than drugs, better than, you know, binge-watching TV serials. But it doesn't really take you into the, the depths of what it can offer. Now, before we go into the other way of getting here, there is another possibility. That you come onto the spiritual path, perhaps in response to something that's happened, perhaps pushing things away. Whether it's just the stress of the world you're living in, a professional world, a very busy metropolitan world. So you may come by pushing that away. But if once you are on the spiritual path, once you are in the ashram, or once you're meditating, or once you've connected with the Sangha, you actually allow it to touch and expand your heart, then it doesn't matter why you got in. It's like a lot of people say, oh God, you know, in the West, people are only getting into yoga to look good. And I always say, I don't mind why people get into yoga. Of course, yoga is a very, very deep and profound practice that includes much more than the physical asanas that we do that might get the body in shape. But to say somebody came into yoga only to get in shape, and therefore that's wrong, undermines the power that yoga has. It doesn't matter why you get in. Yoga has a power in and of itself that even if you got into it to lose weight or you got into it because you had a bad knee or you got into it because you liked the clothes because you thought they were, they were cute, you needed an opportunity to wear your yoga pants. You know, whatever, whatever the reason was that you got into it, Dhanivabhya. Yoga itself has a, has a power. And that power, that shakti, grabs you and transforms you. So in the same way, if you come into a spiritual path, even if you think that you're coming just to get away from the stress or to get away from a difficult relationship or to get away from something that was paining you, if you allow yourself to really open to the magic of meditation, of prayer, of yoga, of living a life that's focused on spirit, rather than focused on matter. That's really the difference. In a purely semantic way, a spiritual life is a life focused on spirit. A material life is a life focused on matter. No judgment, no better than or worse than. Just a semantic difference. We focus on essence rather than form. So we focus on the soul, the spirit, the truth of who you are, rather than the vehicle you've come in. So if you allow yourself to really open to that, it's going to transform you. And so it doesn't matter why you got in, as long as you really allow it to touch you. And that it doesn't become just a band-aid for your brokenness. This is something we had started speaking about last night in terms of meditation and psychoanalysis. Because sometimes spirituality can be used just as a band-aid. I don't want to think about something that's hurting me. So I will just do my mantra instead. Well, in some ways... That's a great practice. One of the great benefits of having a mantra is when you find your brain, your mind going off in dysfunctional, non-helpful, pain-inducing directions, 
you have a mantra to give it instead. But if there's something really important in your life you need to look at, not just the nonsense of the mind doing its thing. Not just the constant commentator, the constant critic. Not just that, but if there's actually something in your life you need to look at. Well, the answer is not, how can I ignore it and just chant my mantra instead? So, we have to allow ourselves to open to the fullness of the path and not just use it as a band-aid. Whether you've come to it running toward or whether you've come to it running away, either way, don't worry. The question is now you're here. How you got here doesn't matter, now you're here. Did you push against Delhi or did you aim for Rishikesh? Now you're here. And now once you're here, the question is what to do. How do I open myself fully to the power, the possibility of where I am? It doesn't always feel good in the same way that having you know, a tumor removed does not feel good. On the other hand, you need to do it if you want to live. You know, if, every, if everybody in a hospital said, forget it, doctor. This is way more painful than I had thought. Forget it. The food is bad. There's no fresh air. Forget it, I want out. Well, you could get out. But in a short period of time, you'd probably find that the tumor had taken over your life, or taken your life. And in the same way, when we struggle with our ego, when we struggle with our desires, when we struggle with our fears, when we struggle with, they're all aspects of the ego. But when we struggle with these, it's an operation of sort. And it's not always, it's not always fun doesn't always feel good on the level that we've become used to things feeling good. On the level of making our ego feel good about ourselves, making our hearts feel good about ourselves. And it's always, it's always on this very superficial level. Oh my God, you are so beautiful. Oh my God, you're so smart. Oh my God, that was, that w what you just did was so great. This is, this is how, how most of us are used to, used to living. You're just, you're the best. That's, that's what feels good to us. And when, when on the path it doesn't feel good, whether in meditation we find ourselves face to face with aspects of ourselves that are darker. than the people were scared to, you know, read about in the news. When we when we discover aspects of ourselves that have that have darkness. Face to face with our own darkness, face to face with our own shadow, face to face with our own I like to say negative sides, but our, our other side, our darker side. It feels a lot better to run, to run from that. When we find ourselves on the path, however we got here, running from or running toward, we need to understand we're here for a reason. And to allow ourselves to really open up. Because underneath it all, it is beautiful. Underneath it all, it is just nothing but grace. But to get there, it's like, you know, when we perform the yagna in the, 
in the ceremony on the banks of Ganga and we offer into the fire. One of the meanings of that which we offer into the fire is, you know, it's a mixture of seeds. And the symbol of that is that the seed is a symbol of our ego. If you take a seed and you plant it in fertile ground, shine the sun on it, you water it, that seed is going to sprout. And then it's going to get roots. And then later when you want to uproot it, it's going to be very difficult. It's much easier to uproot a sapling than to uproot a tree. And our egos, in the same way, when they grow their roots into us, They grow their roots around our hearts, around our identities, around our emotions, around everything that we think of as me. And then someone comes along or a practice comes along or our higher nature comes along and says, I've got to uproot this thing. It feels like it's pulling all of us out with it. And this this yagna, the symbolism of that, is that if you take a seed and you roast it before you plant it, you actually can never get it to sprout. doesn't matter how good the soil is, how much rain, how much sun. The seed will never sprout. And so when we perform the ceremony through the seeds, we are offering our ego with this prayer of, Oh God, roast my ego, literally. Roast the seed of my ego. So that no matter who tells me I'm wonderful and perfect, or who tells me I'm horrible and worthless, because both of them are ego. I'm the best is also ego, and I'm the worst is also ego. I deserve much better than this is ego. I deserve nothing at all is also ego. Ego is not just arrogance, how we typically tend to use it. The ego is that whole false sense of who we are, whether we think we're the best or we think we're the worst. So we offer the seeds, oh God, roast the seeds of my ego, so that regardless of what happens in my life, that seed will not sprout. And these roots will not grow in me. So that when when I want to remove the ego, when I want to become free of it, I can. And the last part to just mention on this subject in terms of ego is <clears throat> we talk a lot about being egoless, having no ego. This is very, very difficult. It's nearly impossible, particularly if you're moving in the world, because it's the ego that says, I'm the one over here, and you're the one over there. Being totally egoless would live every single minute and every moment with an awareness that just I'm soul, your soul, there is not even your soul, I'm soul, but just there is nothing but soul, singular, not plural, not souls, but soul. And we're all just different vehicles, different waveforms of the same ocean. But to move through the world like that is really difficult. But in order to become free of the ego, you don't actually have to no longer have an ego. You don't have to annihilate it completely in order to be free of it. And that I have found to be a much more doable goal is, okay, I can still lose sight of the fact that we are just soul. I can forget that this is just a vehicle and I can can slip back into a sense of this is me and that's you. 
But if I don't allow that to bind me, to chain me, then I'm still free of it. It exists. I haven't annihilated it completely. I have to maintain a watchful eye over it so it doesn't, you know, decide to try to run the show again. But with that watchful eye, with that witness, with that awareness, that mindfulness, I can still have an experience of self, knowing that that's not the highest truth, but knowing that I'm not there yet, and yet not have the ego be the dictator. Not have the ego say things to me like, how dare he say that? I'm going to show him a thing or two. Not having the ego call the shot. Not having the ego say to me, oh my God, I can't believe you did that. That was so horrible. You are the worst. Because the ego can exist without running the show. And if we can try to work to first become free of it so that it's still there, But it's not, it's not pulling our chains. We're not puppets, that you know, marionettes, and it's just pulling the strings and we're dancing accordingly. Slap this one, hug this one, based on what they've said or done to me. Run here, run away from here, based on which way makes me feel good. If I can stop dancing according to the way it pulls the strings, then it may still exist in me, but I'm no longer its slave. And that becomes really the key. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth Radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. Compassion in peaceful suffering. Well, first of all, here's what's really interesting about compassion compared to sympathy or pity. Sympathy and pity tend to be very temporary emotional states that we go through for another being. Oh my God, that's horrible. Oh my God, I can't believe that happened, you poor thing thing. Compassion actually connects us. Compassion unites us. Compassion opens my heart so wide that you're now inside. And it embraces this union of both of us. 
So we've all suffered. Now, when you're suffering, what do you want? Anybody want somebody to tell them what to do? Anybody want somebody to come up with the answers of how they're going to fix it? And yet, ironically, that's what we tend to do for other people. And we do it, again, out of our best intentions. Your suffering, my instinct is, let me fix this for you. And of course, A, it never works. B, it never even helps. And all it tends to do even more is drive wedges between us. Because now... I don't even want you in my space because I don't want to be told how to fix it. Clearly, since I'm the one suffering, I've run through every possible option in my brain 2,000 times. And should there be any available options to me, for whatever reason, in this moment, I'm not ready to take them. And really what I need is just your presence. Now, presence does not require misery. So I don't have to be miserable with you. I just have to be present with you. And in that presence is an openness to that person to go as far as they need to go in their misery, that their misery doesn't scare you. See, when we try to fix people, or tell them it's all going to be okay, or don't worry. Really what that means is, I'm so uncomfortable with your sadness that I need us as a collective to get out of this quickly. So let's, let's start talking solutions. And really what people need is us to just fearlessly be able to be present with them in their misery, in their pain. And that's not easy, by any means. But when we ask ourselves what we can do for people who are suffering, that's what we can do. Because I know for myself, for others I've talked to, that when I'm suffering, what you want is just someone who isn't scared by your suffering, someone who's able to sit there and be present physically, emotionally, spiritually, energetically, who doesn't need to tell me not to worry about it. But I have no need to make that person miserable. There's no sense in my misery that I need you also to be miserable. I want you to be present. but you don't need to be miserable. And then here's the last piece of that, is your presence in compassion, in a state of connection, actually holds not only their pain, but it holds the truth of the existence of joy. Which, when we are in pain, is a truth that is very, very, very difficult for us to conceive of. It's not something I want to hear you say. I don't want you to tell me there's going to be a light at the end of the tunnel or this too shall pass or that I should just think about the happy times. You know, I don't want it like that. But in your presence that holds the presence of joy, It allows me to remember, without you shoving it down my throat, that there is also another truth. And this for me is so deeply and beautifully portrayed here on the banks of Ganga. We do arati sitting on these steps. You look across Ganga, and if you look a little bit downriver, If you're facing Ganga, say at about 11 p.m., if it were a clock, is where the Rishikesh cremation grounds are. And 
the first night I noticed that a cremation was going on, I had this, as we were singing and chanting ecstatically and clapping and dancing, I had this moment of, oh my God. And my heart went out to the people on the other side thinking how they must be feeling to be standing over the burning body of a loved one and having to listen to these people have the audacity to sing and celebrate. Because for so many of us, particularly those of us from the West, there's this sense of the world should stop, like how dare the sun even rise, because we've so well compartmentalized mourning from joy, life from death. And then I realized, but in India that isn't true. They absolutely don't feel like that. There is absolutely no sense. In fact, we have so many people come here to actually do final rites of a loved one who time it in such a way that they'll get here early enough in the day to be able to do the final rites, still have a bath in Ganga, and join us for the evening arti. Those, those dividing lines that we have abroad, they really don't exist here. There isn't that sense of a place for mourning versus a place for celebration, a time for mourning, a time for celebration. And if you look out over Ganga and it's just so meditatively beautiful, you realize that the flames from the fire of their cremation seem very separate from us with this big river between us. But if you go a few feet in the air, you realize that the flames from their cremation mingle with the flames from our arti in such a way that just a few feet above that water, you can't even tease them apart. And I think that that's actually one of the main reasons that people in this culture are just so much healthier, I think, with regard to the presence of death the way that it's interwoven with life, because it is interwoven. And yeah, here we're celebrating and here we're mourning. And I mention it re with regard to this issue of an aspect of compassion, because in order for us to be present with the people who are mourning, we don't have to stop singing. We just have to acknowledge them and take them into our prayers. And that really is the deepest level of compassion. And you should never feel, never feel guilty for being happy. Because as we all know, when we're not in a moment of pain, there's always something to be happy about. And just because a loved one is having a difficult time finding that doesn't mean that you should feel guilty for finding that. And anyone who makes you feel guilty for not being miserable with them or makes you feel guilty for having the audacity to still be able to smile while they're in pain is someone who's having a lot of difficulty processing aspects of their own pain. Doesn't make it your responsibility to, you know, take them through it, but it gives you a window into the idea that what they're going through is not just the pure mourning or the pure loss, but is actually more of a mixed bag and that's okay and you can help them you know hold their hands and be present with them through that as well but that doesn't mean that you have to get also brought into that because when you're connected deeply with someone when you sit with them you're able to feel their pain anyway you're not telling jokes anyway you're not giggling anyway. And the fact that you are 
still able to access joy in your life should be a gift to them as a light of another truth. This brings to a close this hour of inspiration and transformation. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be together with you all each week. And I look forward to being together again next Thursday, same time, on Ohm Times Radio. Thank you.